Welcome everyone, this is Algebra 2, Section 2.1, Day 2, or Part 2, and we are continuing on the section of solving using square roots. So we finished off last time, on last video, with talking about some vocab, with what a radical is, radicand, perfect squares, simplifying radicals, and then also the product property. Now we're going to start with multiplying radicals. So, you'll multiply... the outsides with, that's my width, the w slash, outsides with outsides, and insides with insides, aka outsides and outsides, those are going to be like the regular numbers, so like example 2a, the 3 outside the radical and the 2 outside the radical would be the outsides. And the insides and insides are the radicands, what's inside the radical. So like 3 inside there and the 10 inside. So on example 2a, as we multiply the outsides with the outside, we do 3 times 2 on the outside and we get 6. And on the inside we get 3 times 10, which is square root of 30. So you multiply the regular numbers with the regular numbers, square roots with square roots, and if you can, then you would simplify from there, but we can't simplify the square root of 30. Letter B, 2 square root 12, 5 square root 2. So 2 times 5, the regular ones, yeah, then we get 10. And square root 12, square root 2, multiply to get square root 24, because 12 times 2 is 24. Here we can simplify more because the square root of 24 is the same thing as the square root of 4 times the square root of 6. And 4 is a perfect square. So that'll be 10 times 2 times the square root of 6. But remember, 10 times 2, we have to actually do that multiplication to get 20 square root 6. So once again, it really was the same idea to start off with as compared to letter A here, except for we just could go farther because we can simplify the square root of 24, though on letter A we could not simplify the square root of 30. Now you might be wondering, hey, Mr. Gossel, would I have been able to simplify back here when it was the square root of 12? And the answer is you definitely could have. Had you have done that, it would have looked like this. So let me draw what it would have looked like above this line. So you would have taken this and said, okay, well, that's 2 square root 4 square root 3, because 4 times 3 is 12, times 5 times the square root 2. Well, 2 square root 4 is 2 times root er, 2 times a 2 instead of 2 times square root 4. So that would be 4 square root 3 times 5 square root 2. Multiply those together, 4 times 5, the regular numbers, you get 20. And square root 3 times square root 2, the radicals, you get square root 6. So we get the same ending answer. Um, it's just a different approach as to how to get there. It takes the same amount of steps in my opinion. Um, so it's really just a preference. Letter C. 4 square root 7 times the square root of 7. So, regular numbers, this is 4 times the invisible 1. So this is 4. And square root 7 times square root 7 is the square root of 49. Now the square root of 49 is, is a perfect square, so we don't have to simplify it by saying what goes into it. We just say, hey, that's 7. So that's 28. When you do 4 times the 7. And letter D, 4 times the square root of 3, quantity, or all of it, being squared. Now we have to be careful here um, when we do this, because we're not just squaring one of them, we're squaring both of them. The best way to remember how to write that, remember how to do it, is to write it by writing two of these multiplied together. Because we have to recall that squaring something means it's two of them multiplied together. So we'll literally write 4 square root of 3 twice, and have them multiply. So then we'll do regulars times regulars. 4 times 4 is 16. Square root 3 times square root 3 to get square root 9. Square root 9 is 3. We have 16 times 3. And then that ends up giving us 48. Now here's the little note. Square root a times square root a ends up being the square root of a squared. a times a is a squared, so it follows that when you multiply with the square roots, you get the same thing. Now, 
the square root of a squared, aka what times itself is a squared? Well, that'd be a. And we can actually notice that the square and the square root undo each other. They are what we call opposite or inverse operations. Just like addition and subtraction, or multiplication and division. They're what we call inverse or opposite operations. They undo each other. So anytime you have a square being square rooted, they undo each other. Now, the same thing's actually true for um, the other way around. A square and a square root, it would undo it that way too. Just like addition undoes subtraction and subtraction undoes addition. It works both directions. So, all under D, it could have worked out as saying, hey, square root 3 being squared is just going to be a regular 3. Down here, we see the square root of 5 times the square root of 5 really is just 5. If you want to go the long way, you'd say, okay, well, that's the square root of 25. And then you would journey back and say, well, that's just 5. So if you want, you can just completely skip this middle step and say, hey, if you have two of the same thing, two of the same radicands, two of the same number, two of the same variable, whatever it is, underneath the radical, multiplying together, then they're going, you're going to just get the radicand. You're going to get what's underneath. Now dividing radicals. You want to separate or condense your radicals to simplify. So separate was like we're spreading them out, and condense is the opposite. We're putting them together. So square root of a over b, the entire fraction a divided by b is being square rooted, is the same thing as the square root of a divided by the square root of b separately. So that would be separate. Now condense would be the second one, where we're saying a square root of a divided by the square root of b already separate is the same thing as a divided by b and take the square root of the whole thing. So that would be condensing it into one square root. So a lot of times you want to do one or the other to really help us. And we'll kind of see what we mean here. So on example 3a, we have division. We have the square root of the fraction 25 over 9. Now, 25 and 9, nothing goes into both numbers. So this is where we want to separate it, because you can't reduce this fraction. So we want to say, hey, it's the square root of 25 divided by the square root of 9. Now on the top, we notice, hey, the square root of 25, that's 5. On the bottom, we notice the square root of 9, that's 3. 5 divided by 3. Well, I can't reduce that fraction, so I'm done. That looks a lot nicer than it was before. So what we did on that one was we said, hey, it's currently condensed. We see this whole fraction as part of the radicand underneath the square root there. And they can't simplify 25 and 9, so we separated it into two different radicals. radicals excuse me. And then they were both perfect squares. So it worked out very well for us. On letter B. The square root of 4 divided by 5 times the square root of th 3 over 20. Here, we can't reduce 4 over 5, and we can't reduce 3 over 20. But also, only 4 is a perfect square. 5, 3, and 20 aren't. But since they're multiplying, let's actually just multiply straight across like you would any fraction. But remember, that it'll just stay under the square roots. So this ends up being the square root of 12 on the top, over square root of 100. 
Now, something does go into 12 and 100, but it's actually going to be more helpful for us right now to leave it as is. And you might notice why. If not, it's because 100 is a perfect square. So if we separate these into the square root of 12 on the top and the square root of 100 on the bottom, then on the bottom, we can call this 10. That's nice. That's really nice, because we actually don't want radicals in the, in the denominator. As we mentioned earlier under simplifying radicals at the top of this page. And then the square root of 12 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 3. Well, the square root of 4 is 2. The square root of 3 is square root of 3 over 10. So we get 2 square root of 3 over 10. Well, now we can reduce even further and say 2 and 10, we can reduce those. Those are both regular numbers. We can reduce them. 2 and 10, that's 1 and 5. I don't need to write 1 times the square root of 3. I can just write the square root of 3 over 5. And that would be my final answer. Now you might be wondering, Mr. Kossel, what would have happened had I divided this here, the square root of 12 divided by the square root of 100. Well, let's talk about it. If I would have continued on from here, square root of 12 over square root of 100, um, excuse me, had I continued on from rather here, where they were just in one fraction, and we had reduced it, it actually wouldn't have turned out poorly for us at all. We say, hey, 12 and 100, 2 goes into both, but even more so, 4 goes into both. And so we'd say, okay, well, this is really the square root of the fraction 3 divided by 25. So that says, okay, well, square root 3 over square root 25. Hey, guess what? The square root of 25, that's a perfect square. Square root of 3 over 5. So we got the same exact answer either way. All right, letter C. Square root of 20 divided by the square root of 5. Here, neither of these are perfect squares. And yeah, we could reduce the square root of 20 um, if we want. I'm going to have us actually start, though, by condensing these into one fraction, or into one square root. Square root of the fraction, 20 divided by 5. Now, the reason this is helpful is we can simplify 20 divided by 5. That's 4, but it's still the square root of 4. Now, the square root of 4 is 2, so the problem's done. All right, continuing on to page four of this note packet. Or at least I believe it's my page four. It might be your page five. Rationalizing radicals. So radicals should always be written in what we call simplest form like we talked about before. And we said one of the things for simplest form was that we have the um, smallest number possible as a radicand, aka there's no perfect square factors underneath the radical. And the other thing was that there's no radicals in the denominator. That's the one we're concerned about right now. Because we've already talked about the previous one. So to eliminate the radical in the denominator, we're going to simplify the numerator and denominator if possible. That actually happened a lot on these last examples. Where here, we would have had a radical in the denominator on each and every one of these, but instead, we ended up simplifying through division. And the letter B is, if necessary, aka if option A doesn't work, multiply the top and the bottom by the square root uh, in the denominator. Specifically, we want to do by that square root. So in example 4a, we'll have, to, we'll have a scenario where we need to do this. 
we have the square root of the fraction 3 over 2. So 3 and 2, those don't reduce. So we'll say, hey, let's separate it. The square root of 3 over the square root of 2. Now, we don't want this radical in the denominator. And we can't reduce the, either of these radicals or simplify either radical 3 or 2. So what we'll want to do is multiply the top bottom of a fraction. Similar to when we get like common denominators when we add and subtract fractions. We have to multiply the top and the bottom to keep it balanced. And we'll do it by the square root of 2 because that's the square root in the denominator. We don't care about the one in the numerator right now. So the result for this straight across is the square root of 6. And we just said a bit ago that the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, a.k.a. square root times itself, is going to end up being regular 2. If you want to walk through that, it would end up being the square root of 4, 2 times 2, and the square root of 4 is regular 2. And that's the reason why we're always going to multiply the denominator and the numerator by whatever the radical is in the denominator. Because that'll always end up having this work out where we take that times itself and we get that number outside the radical. Now square root 6 over 2 cannot be simplified any further, so it is done. Letter B, 10 divided by the square root of 5. So once again, can't simplify these. Well, you, you might be saying, well, 10 and 5, yeah, 5 goes into 10. Twice, actually. Um, the reason you can't, though, is 5 is the square root and 10 is not. So just like you could not multiply them, we cannot divide them either. So I want to multiply by the square root of 5 over the square root of 5. And on the top, we just get... 10 times square root of 5 because you can't multiply a square root in a normal number. On the bottom, the square root of 5 times it itself is just regular 5. Now we can reduce a regular 10 and a regular 5 to 2 on the top times the square root of 5 over 1. But we don't need to write over 1. So we just get 2 square root of 5. And letter C, square root 13 over square root 8, same idea, can't reduce, neither of them are perfect squares, so I'll multiply by the square root in the denominator. So we end up getting on the top, the square root of 104, as we multiply 13 and 8, and the bottom, we just get regular 8. Now the top actually can be reduced now, so we have to do that. The square root of 104 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 26 over regular 8. The square root of 4 is 2 times the square root of 26 over 8. 2 and 8 reduce the normal numbers. So we'll end up getting 1 times the square root of 26, which that 1 does not need to be written. Over... Four is our final answer. <coughs> now, I was actually um, misspoke when I said that the problem could not be reduced or simplified. We can actually simplify the bottom right away if we would like, the square root of 8. And I might recommend that to you because it's going to keep your numbers smaller. It's going to keep that from becoming this 104 and trying to figure out perfect squares from there. So what would have happened had we done that? I'll write that over here and just kind of draw a little line saying, hey, we're going to work over here. Is you said, hey, the square root of 13 over the square root of 8. I'm going to call it square root of 13 over the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. Because 4 times 2 is 8. And 4 is a perfect square. So we're going to get the square root of 13 over 2 square root 2. So now that, excuse me, now that the denominator only has the radical square root 2 in it, that's what we need to multiply both sides by. We're not concerned at all about the fact that there's a regular 2 in the denominator. We don't need to multiply by that. We only had to multiply by the square root of the denominator. So I'll multiply the top and bottom by the square root 2. 
and get the square root of 26 over 2 times the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, aka 2. Well, 2 times 2 gives us the square root of 26 over 4. So we get the same answer either way, and the numbers ended up staying smaller. Did it get all the way up to 104? The biggest they got was 26. And once again, that was able to be the case because we were able to reduce the square root of 8. So we can see how either way we ended up getting the same answer, whether we didn't reduce or whether we did. Letter D, square root 12 over the square root 24. I'm going to let you guys try this one. Pause the video, and then when you're done or get stuck, continue on with the video. So these, I'm going to leave it um, condensed because I can reduce 12 and 24. 1 over 2. Now this, now I'm going to separate it. Square root of 1 over the square root of 2. Well, the square root of 1 on the top, that's just 1. On the bottom, we don't like that the square root of 2 is down there. So we're going to multiply the top and the bottom by that. And on the top, 1 times anything is the other thing. On the bottom, a square root times itself is the regular number. So you get square root 2 over 2, which you cannot reduce because 1 is underneath a radical and 1 is not. Next, we're actually going to start solving quadratic equations with square roots. Step one is to get the variable or quantity squared by itself. So get whatever is being squared by itself on one side of the equation, aka isolate that. Second step is to take the square root of both sides. Remember, you have to do both sides. And you should get two answers most of the time. Now, once again, that's not all the time on purpose, but the majority you should. And I'm going to just underline, hey, that's two answers. Now, the reason why you get two answers is because let's just talk about how the square root of 9. Like, what times itself is 9? Well, you have 3, of course. 3 times 3 is 9. But we also forget that negative 3 times negative 3 ends up being a positive 9 as well. Because it's the same number, 3 and 3. And a negative times a negative is a positive. Now, if they were opposite signs, it's like a positive 3 and a negative 3, that'd give you a negative 9. Whole different scenario. So here, we have to factor positive and negative versions of the square root. You might be wondering, Mr. Castle, where did the square root of 9 and these 3's come from? I just used a random example to prove the point. Or explain the point, I should say. All right, example five, <coughs> letter A. 2x squared minus 16 equals zero. Let's identify what's being squared. That's the first step is to get whatever is being squared by itself on one side of the equation. So the 16 is not being squared. This two is not even being squared. What is being squared is just the x. So our goal is to get x squared by itself. So we say what's happening to it it's getting multiplied by 2, and it's getting subtracted by 16. So I'm going to undo that subtraction first by adding 16 to both sides. And I get 2x squared equals 16. Now I'm going to undo the division, or see multiplication by division, and get x squared equals 8. Now, step 1 is complete. I have the variable or quantity that's being squared by itself on one side of the equation. Now on to step two. I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Just like any operation, I add something to both sides, divide both sides, I can square or square root both sides. Now, as long as I do both sides, I'm keeping it equal. So as we do this, we say, hey, well, what times itself is x squared? What's well, gonna be x? x times x is x squared. Equals, now we don't know what the square root of eight is. We can just call it the square root of 8 for now. 
But we have to uh, keep in mind, it'll not be the positive version only, but also the negative version. So that's how you can write the positive and negative version of the square root of 8. We're not done yet, though, because we can still reduce the square root of 8. So we get x equals positive negative square root 4 square root 2. So that's really positive and negative 2 square root 2. And real quick, what happened again was we said, hey, let's identify what's being squared. That was the variable x only. So we undid that, um, everything else around it to get it by itself. So we added 16 first and then divide it by 2. Then we were able to say, hey, x squared is by itself finally. So we square rooted both sides of the equation. It left us with the positive and negative version. So it's really two different answers. And then we were, um, were able to simplify the square root of 8, so we did. Letter B. Excuse me. Letter B. X squared equals 12. Now, um, what's being squared is just x squared. So that's already by itself. So we can just go ahead and square root both sides. X is equal to the positive and negative square root of 12. Now we can reduce the square root of 12 to the square root of 4 times the square root of 3. So it ends up being x is equal to the positive and negative versions of 2 square root 3. That one's a little bit nicer. All right, let us see. Negative 5x squared plus 9 equals 0. Might be a good idea for you to try this one on your own. All right, what's being squared is, being, is my x. So I'm going to subtract 9 from both sides. And you get negative 5x squared equals negative 9. Divide both sides by negative 5 to undo the multiplication. And I get x squared equals positive 9 over 5. Because a negative 5 by negative is a positive. Now I'm going to square root both sides to get my squared term by itself. And I get x is equal to the positive and negative square root of 9 over square root of 5. I went ahead and separated them because the square root of 9 is a perfect square. So I get x is equal to the positive and negative 3 over the square root of 5. Now on the bottom, we don't want the square root of 5 to be um, in the fraction. So we're in the denominator. I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by the square root of 5, giving me x is equal to positive or negative 3 square root of 5 over regular 5, because the square root times itself is the regular number. Letter D. 2 times the quantity of x plus 1 being squared is equal to 8. So what's being squared is all of x plus 1. So that's what you get by itself. So it's being multiplied by 2. So we must divide both sides by 2. So we get x plus 1 being squared is equal to 4. Now, since what's being squared is by itself, we square root both sides. And we said earlier that the square and square root undo each other. So we're going to be left with Whatever is left in the parentheses, x plus 1 is equal to positive and negative 2. Now at this point, I like to split the equation into two different parts, and I, we'll see why in a moment. So one of them will be x plus 1, that didn't change at all, just the left side of the equation, equals positive 2. So I picked one of those signs. And my other one is going to be x plus 1, same thing on the left, is equal to negative 2. So the reason that this is so important to do is now if we subtract 1 from both sides, we say, OK, well, that ends up being x is equal to 1, 
which does work because if we plug negative r to positive 1 back into this equation, we get 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 squared is 4, and 4 times 2 is 8. All right, on the right-hand one that we did, x plus 1 equals negative 2, let's subtract 1 from each side, and we end up getting x is equal to negative 3. So you might notice how those are two different answers entirely. And that's because x could be either of these. Now, before, when we got two answers, they were just positive and negative versions of the same exact number in square root. This time, because square root 4 was a perfect square, we're able to say, we're able to not only go farther than having a radical as part of the answer, but we're able to split the equation and do the adding, subtracting of 1 because there is still more to do there. Letter E. 5 times quantity of x minus 7 being squared is equal to 135. I recommend you try this one on your own. Now what's being squared is x minus 7. So I'm going to divide both sides by 5. I get x minus 7 being squared is equal to 27. Now I'll square root both sides, undo the square, and I get x minus 7, whatever's left in the parentheses, aka, is equal to whatever the square root of 27 is. Well, that's positive and negative square root of 9 times the square root of 3. Say 9, because 9 is a perfect square. x minus 7 is equal to positive and negative 3 times the square root of 3. Now we just have to add 7. You might be wondering, Mr. Castle, are we going to split the equation again? And I'd say, you know what? It's actually not going to be as handy for us this time, purely because we don't have a perfect square as our answer. On the last problem, letter D, we had a perfect square of 4, so it made a lot more sense to split because we were actually able to finish these equations. And we just won't be able to finish here, these equations, with not knowing... Um, what is exactly happening with the start of these? Excuse me. By, let me see if I can phrase that better. By, hmm. Oh, I can't think of how to phrase it. I apologize. We'll move on from now and see if I think of it later. Sorry about that. Now, to continue solving, I do need to get rid of this minus 7. So I'm going to add 7 to both sides. Now, I sure as heck don't know what 7 plus the square, 3 square root of 3 is, or 7 plus a negative square, 3 square root of 3 is. But what I can do is just write 7 plus or minus 3 square root of 3. I can just write that down. And I would prefer that you write that 7 before the plus or minus, rather than writing it this way x equals plus or minus, positive or negative, 3 square root 3 plus 7. Because it's possible that some people would think that this might end up having to change signs when this changes signs. Whereas if you have it in front of that, it might be, it's typically a little easier for us to realize, oh, that's not part of the sign, uh, the two different signs that we have going on. Oh, I remembered how to try to say what I was going to do earlier. The reason why it wouldn't be as beneficial to split here is we can't actually do 7 plus 3 squared 3 without using a calculator. Whereas on the last problem, we could add something to the square root of 4 because the square root of 4 is just 2 or negative 2. All right, letter F. 1 half times x plus 5 being squared is equal to 7. So what's being squared is x plus 5. Get that by itself. By getting rid of this 1 half, now, I don't want to divide by 1 half because that creates a double deck fraction. And I don't like that at all. So I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal to accomplish the same goal, 2 over 1. If I do that, I can multiply the other side or have to multiply the other side by 2 or 2 over 1. 2 and 2 reduce, and you're left with just x plus 5 being squared is equal to 14. Now, what's being squared is by itself, so I'm going to square root both sides, and that will undo itself, so I get x plus 5 equals the positive and negative square root of 14. Square root of 14 has no um, 
perfect square of factors. Now I'm going to subtract the 5 to get the x by itself. And once again, I want to write that minus 5 or the negative 5 before the plus or minus 14, square root of 14. All right. Example 6 and 7, applications, a.k.a. word problems. A water balloon is dropped from a window 59 feet above the sidewalk. How long does it take for the water balloon to hit the sidewalk? Use the equation h is equal to negative 16t squared plus h sub 0, sub 0 because it's below hand, where h is the height of the balloon at time t, and h sub 0 is the initial height of the balloon. So, we know the formula we're going to use. h is equal to negative 16t squared plus h sub 0. Now we've got to plug things in. So we're told it's dropped from window 59 feet above the sidewalk. Well, h is the height of the balloon at time t, a.k.a. after this many seconds, it's this high up still, or this far from the ground, I should say. Whereas h sub 0 is the initial height where it starts at. That initial height is what we know to be 59 feet. So we have h is equal to negative 16t squared plus 59. Now, we're going to solve this one the same way we have been. But wait a second. We still need to know a little bit more. Well, we want to know how long does it take for the water balloon to hit the sidewalk. Well, let's ask ourselves this question. What's the height at this point in time if it's hitting the sidewalk? How high is it from the sidewalk? The answer to that would be zero. It is zero feet above the sidewalk if it is hitting the sidewalk. So we can replace regular age with just zero. Now I can start solving this equation for my square term, which is my t, by subtracting 59 from both sides. So I get negative 59 is equal to negative 16t squared. Now I'm going to divide by negative 16 to undo the multiplication. And I get, let's see here, I'll just call it 59 over 16, because I don't think they reduce at all is equal to t squared. Because of, and the pot negative, excuse me, negative divided by negative is a positive. Now I'm going to square root both sides of this equation to undo the t squared. So I'm going to square root the left side as well. So I get the square root of 59 over the square root of 16. You might say, Mr. Castle, why do you separate those? And I say, well, the square root of 16, we know what that is. So that'll be helpful for us. And this is going to be equal to t. On the bottom there, the square root of 16, that is going to be 4. On the top, we're just going to have to leave it the square root of 59, unfortunately, equals t. Now, technically, way back when we square rooted both sides, we should have a positive and negative for this, shouldn't we? But we have to remember that for this word problem, this application, T stands for time. Can you have negative time? Is that possible to have negative time in a measurement? No, you really can't. So that's why we, can not, we don't have to worry about the negative version. And we can just use the positive version of the square root, because that's what it has to be at the end of the day anyway. Last but not least, example 7. On the moon, the distance in feet, d, that an object falls in time, t, in seconds, is modeled by the function d of t is equal to 8 thirds t squared. Suppose an astronaut on the moon drops a tool. How long does it take for the tool to fall 4 feet? All right, so... The distance that it falls in the time is going to be 4. So we're going to put that in for d, um, d of t where that is. So when we don't know what t is yet. So we're going to have 4 
is equal to 8 over 3 t squared. Now I'm going to multiply both sides by 3 over 8 to get rid of that fraction multiplying with it. And 4 is over 1 there. If we want to make our life a little easier. On the left side, 8 and 4 reduce to 2 and 1, respectively. And so on the top, 3 times 1 is 3. On the bottom, 2 times 1 is 2. <clears throat> on the right side, 3 and 3 reduce, 8 and 8 reduce, and you're left with t squared. Now I'm going to square root both sides. And I'm going to separate them into square root of 3 over square root of 2, because I can't reduce at all between those two numbers, is equal to just t. And once again, I should technically have the positive and negative versions of these square roots, but the negative one currently doesn't matter. So I still need to fix this, so I need to multiply both sides, excuse me, the top and the bottom, by the square root of 2, because I don't like that radical in the denominator. So I'll have the square root of 6, 3 times 2, over regular 2. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is the square root of 4. I should say seconds.